Into three general areas. First of all, I want to give you my perspective on aging in general, talking about successful versus usual aging. And then I want to talk about various aspects of physical activity and aging, and then spend a few minutes introducing you to the project that Russ and I are working on, a big NIH common fund initiative known as MotorPAC, or the Molecular Transducers of Physical Activity Consortium. So if we think about aging, it's the change in biological function um, relative to age. And I'm just focusing on adulthood here. So if we wanted to define ideal aging, it would be a condition where we would maintain our highest level of function until the day we died. And that's uh, not achievable unless you meet a traumatic end early in life, and we wouldn't call that ideal either. So maybe what we should be shooting for is successful aging, where we maintain a relatively high level of function as long as we can, then we start seeing a slow decline in biological function across multiple systems. And at some point, maybe around age 75 or 80, the, the slope gets a little bit slipperier and that rate of decline tends to increase. And um, many of us can experience successful aging, but I think the majority of people in this country might experience what we would define as usual aging, where the primary or unavoidable consequences of aging are exacerbated by things like disease or increasing obesity, declining physical activity levels, or exposure to environmental toxins such as uh, pollution or radiation. And I think what's even mo more concerning um, is that the fact that some of these modifiable factors have become more prevalent, things like obesity and physical inactivity, that many of our youth today don't even achieve their highest level of biological function. So they're starting on a trajectory uh, where they might intersect with disability or frailty earlier than expected, which of course has a big impact on thinking about what geriatrics in the future is going to look like. So if we think of successful and usual uh, aging as something that is primary, unavoidable, or uh, secondary, and modifiable, let's think about some things that fall into these categories. There is uh, an unavoidable decrease in maximal heart rate with aging. It doesn't matter um, how fit you are or how overweight you are. Um, your maximal heart rate goes down as you get older. And in fact, we use age to predict that. Maximal heart rate is estimated as 220 minus your age. So we put that in the category of primary aging. Uh, the loss of reading vision, presbyopia, by age 60, 99% of people will need reading glasses unless you've had refractive surgery. Uh, so let's put that in the primary aging category. And the loss of reproductive function, menopause or andropause in men, uh, is something that is unavoidable, happens in everybody, and is triggered by age. So that would also fall into the primary aging category. But if we think of something like the loss of muscle and bone mass, now a component of that is unavoidable, but we know that lifestyle factors also influence the rate at which you lose bone and muscle. So let's put that in both categories. And if we think of physical activity, um, I think most people would put that into the modifiable category. That's something that we choose to, we choose to be as active as we are. But I'm going to show you some data today to suggest that maybe there is a biological component to how physically active we are, and that as we get older, there's actually a drive to become more sedentary. So that's my perspective, just to get you in the same framework that I'm thinking as we go forward and talk now about physical activity and aging. So here are some data to show you the prevalence of um, meeting what our current physical activity guidelines for Americans are. And the physical activity guidelines currently set the bar relatively low. Um, the recommendation is that adults of all ages should try to be active 150 minutes a week in moderate levels, moderate intensity physical activity, or 75 minutes a week of vigorous intensity activity. So if you look at the two top panels, um, these are people who are just meeting physical activity guidelines or are exceeding them. 
And in young people, if we add up these two bars, about 50% of young adults are meeting uh, guidelines. But adults over the age of 65, only about 30% of them are meeting that minimal level of physical activity that we think is important for maintaining um, or improving health. And if we look at the two bottom categories, these are people who are active but not meeting guidelines, and the proportion of people who report no physical activity. And here, the 65-year-old category is very alarming, not so much in insufficiently active, about 20%, but look at how high this bar st starts to rise. 50% of adults over the age of 65 say they get absolutely no physical activity. And these are in bouts of 10 minutes or more. Um, so the question, going back to that slide where I was showing you primary and secondary factors of aging, where does physical activity fall? Is there an inevitable decline in physical activity as we get older? And I think it might depend on how we measure it. If we try to measure it in units of energy expenditure, um, in ca calories per week, uh, it might be different than if we measure it in minutes per week. And let me show you why. This is uh, a slide that I developed, and I use this one, even though it's from a review article from 1995, because it preceded the obesity epidemic. So I told you that obesity is one of the confounding factors on how physical act or how biological function changes with age. So here's a picture of changes in cardiorespiratory fitness, or VO2 max, over age in women and men. These are cross-sectional data, but each data point on here represents a mean from a published study, so there are literally thousands of cases represented on this figure. And you can see that in both men and women, VO2 max or cardiorespiratory fitness declines as you get older. And um, what you might not know is that this unit of measurement, liters per minute of oxygen consumption, equates roughly to the rate of energy expenditure. So for every one liter of oxygen you consume, you're expending about five kcals uh, per minute. So if we think of um, physical activity and the rate of energy expenditure that you can achieve, Young men around age 25 can burn about 17 calories per minute if they're at their maximal exercise capacity. But when you get out to age 75, that's decreased to about 10 calories per minute. And in uh, women, it goes from about 12 calories per minute on average down to about seven. So with aging, even if you're active for the same amount of time on a daily basis as you get older, you're gonna be burning fewer calories. So I think if we measure, uh, well, let me uh, back up to this. And how does, how does exercise training influence that? This is the same slide that I had um, on the, the previous. These are the curves that I showed you in normally active individuals. And now the solid lines are some uh, highly trained endurance runners and looking at their trajectory over time. So you can f see that the effect of endurance exercise training in both women and men is to increase cardiorespiratory fitness, but when you look at the change in those individuals over time, the slopes of change are essentially the same or perhaps even accelerated uh, rates of decline. So I'm using this slide to show you that exercise training can modify physiologic reserve. It can take you to a higher level on the age curve, but it doesn't really slow the aging process. The rate of decline is still gonna be similar or perhaps even a little bit faster. So you can see that all these curves seem to be funneling down to the same point. So if we think of um, measuring physical activity in kilocalories per minute, then I think the answer to whether there's an inevitable decline is probably yes. To prevent that, you would have to be active many, many more minutes a day or per week to offset that. But that's not how we often measure physical activity. We usually measure it in minutes per week, and that's what our guidelines are based on. And I'm not sure if there's an inevitable, inevitable decline if we measure physical activity this week uh, in this manner. 
So I'd like to go to some preclinical uh, data to show you why I think there may be um, a, a, a decline that occurs that is biologically driven. So this is a study um, in mice where they were housed in cages that had running wheels. So you're looking at a group of animals that was sham operated in terms of whether or not they had their ovaries removed. So there was the surgery, ovaries remained intact. They returned to their cages and they were followed for many weeks. And you can see that mice are, are very active. They do about uh, 10K per day. But the next uh, line I'm gonna add on here is a group of overectomized animals. And if you're in the back of the room, you might not even be able to see this line because it's way down here on the bottom. This is an overectomized group that was eventually treated with placebo hormone therapy. You can see there's no spontaneous recovery of this dramatic decline in how active these animals wanted to be. Here's another group of overectomized animals that not quite as severe a decline, but as soon as you added back uh, one of the ovarian hormones, estradiol, these animals immediately became much more active and were no different from their sham operated controls. So estradiol in female rodents, and this has been studied repeatedly, there are scores of studies now showing this, estradiol controls physical activity, spontaneous physical activity levels in, in laboratory animals. And the same is true for male animals if you gonadectomize them. Uh, so before orchiectomy or sham surgery, these are the levels of activity in running wheels. This is the sham operated group. These are the two orchiectomized groups. You can see this 70% decline in how much these animals move. When you give them back testosterone that normalizes, fully rescues their physical activity phenotype. If you give males estradiol, it's about a 50% recovery. And if you treat them with uh, testosterone and an aromatase inhibitor, which blocks the conversion of testosterone to estradiol, so this is a T-only effect, you still get a full rescue. So testosterone in males and estradiol in females regulates spontaneous physical activity. And if we look, this is going to female animals now, at one of the consequences of that, it would be as expected that this is comparing sham and overectomized uh, mice and rats, just looking at changes in body weight consequent to surgery. So um, sham operated, these are growing animals, so their body weights are, are still going up. But if you look at the overectomized group, the rate of increase is, is very much steepened. And most of that is adiposity, fat mass. The good news is, though, that even though they, they choose to be less active, if you force them to become more active, if you program exercise by putting them on treadmills, you can prevent a lot of the phenotypic consequences of this decline in spontaneous activity. So we're looking at three outcome measures here, change in visceral fat, change in subcutaneous fat, and then change in insulin resistance in three groups of animals, sham operated, overectomized, and then overectomized that get estradiol added back. So in all of these outcomes, you can see that overectomy increases adiposity, specifically in the abdominal region, and insulin resistance that usually accompanies that is present. Estradiol prevents that. But now if you put animals, and these are the sedentary animals, if you put them on treadmills, even in sham operated animals, you see benefits in these outcomes. In the overectomized animals, if you can program their exercise, you uh, essentially completely prevent these phenotypic consequences of overectomy. And the health benefits of exercise are apparent even in the group that got their estradiol replaced. So to summarize um, what is known from the preclinical literature on the effects of overectomy, and these extend to orchiectomy also for a large, in large measure, there's the decrease in physical activity that I, I told you about and showed you. I didn't show you some evidence that energy intake is increased. 
Um, I also didn't show you that independent of the decline in physical activity, there's also a decrease in resting metabolic rate. So energy expenditure goes down both as a result of moving less and because inherent metabolic rate is lower. Um, as you might expect, adiposity goes up, and these seems to be predominantly fat gain in the abdominal region, and then you get all of the uh, metabolic consequences that usually go along with, with abdominal obesity, insulin resistance, hyperlipidemia, and other things. Um, and these changes are prevented or reversed by estradiol. But the big question is, of what relevance is this to humans? And that's something that's of interest in my lab. So we're interested in the consequences of gonadal aging. And we think that because uh, this is an endocrine system, that it could impact other systems in a way that might increase uh, disease risk as we get older. And this is of interest um, because, especially in women, the loss of reproductive fu function occurs in, in mid-age, midlife, whereas in men it's delayed a little bit more. But this might be of, of prime interest to the HIV community because there's at least some suggestion that hypogonadism is more prevalent in HIV than in uh, non-infected individuals. So this is our working model that drives some of our thinking, and we've got uh, an extremely well-studied example of this, and that's the effect of gonadal aging on bone loss. So we know that the loss of ovarian estrogens, and in men, the loss of testosterone and estrogen causes an accelerated rate of bone loss that increases the risk for osteoporosis. But we think that estrogens and potentially androgens could be acting in other tissues, other organs, like maybe the brain or skeletal muscle that could increase risk for dementia or sarcopenia. These are hypothetical. Or maybe it affects um, systemic level function in the body, something like the disruption of energy balance that results in excess fat gain and abdominal fat gain and the attendant uh, diseases that are associated with that increasing obesity. And as I showed you, if gonadal aging does affect spontaneous physical activity, because physical activity has numerous uh, benefits on health, we would expect that this could affect this entire system in a way that could increase chronic disease risk. So that's our working model for uh, the studies that we do. And menopause is extremely difficult to study in women because it's a process, not an event, that takes place over many years. It's even more difficult to study in men because we know much less about it, about when the gonadal system starts to age and over what period of time um, the loss of reproductive function occurs. So we use uh, um, um, an experimental model of this, whereby we study premenopausal women and expose them to a pharmacologic treatment, gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonist that suppresses ovarian function to postmenopausal levels. So this is a drug that's used to treat things like endometriosis or uterine fibroids. So it's, in a sense, a reversible menopause. So in this trial, we... Um, put women on five months of GnRH agonist therapy, therapy. Both groups got this. And then they were e either added back transdermal uh, placebo patches or um, estradiol. So this would be what we would think this group is, is the equivalent of the menopausal group. And by adding back estradiol, we are isolating the actions of that ovarian hormone on our outcomes of interest. So um, I'm going to refer to this as our two-group model. You can see the demographics. These groups were well-matched. But as part of the grant that supported this, we proposed an uh, exploratory aim, whereby one-third of the women in each of the two groups was randomized to undergo a resistance exercise training intervention. Um, and because this was an exploratory aim, we didn't do any inferential statistics on this. It was intended to be hypothesis generating for future studies. So if we look at changes in body composition in this model from the two-group model, this is at the whole body level measured by DEXA. Um, these are changes in fat-free mass or lean mass. 
What people don't appreciate is that we know that the bone compartment of lean mass decreases when we suppress ovarian estrogens. What's not appreciated by most is that there's also a loss of muscle mass. So in this study, the decrease in total body lean mass over just five months was over half a kilogram, and that was fully prevented in the group that received estradiol. Similar results in studies that have used this intervention in men. When you suppress gonadal function in men, they lose, they lose lean mass, and at a similar rate as women. In our study, this is changes in fat mass, we didn't see an increase in fat mass, but that has been observed in many of these trials, including in the trials uh, of men, where suppressing gonadal function increases adiposity even over short periods of time. Now this is at a whole body level. We also wanted to look at uh, skeletal muscle specifically, so we did a CT scan of the mid-thigh, and we also wanted to look at abdominal adiposity, so we did a CT of the midsection. So here are the CT data showing very similar pattern um, in muscle cross-sectional area at the mid-thigh region. And despite the fact that there was no increase in total fat mass in these women when we suppressed their ovarian function, they did have an increase in abdominal subcutaneous fat and even a more dramatic increase in abdominal visceral fat. These are changes over only five months of time. And if we go to our four group model now um, with whole body estimates of lean mass and fat mass. Remember, no inferential statistics, so just look at this in terms of what we would project that the effects might be. Now in our group that got placebo add back, so postmenopausal model, no exercise, the loss of lean mass over five months was almost a kilogram. If we go to the other extreme, this is the group that got estradiol and resistance exercise intervention, they had almost a one kilogram increase in lean mass. And it looks like either estradiol alone or exercise alone might be effective at preserving <laughs> lean mass. If we look at fat mass, um, here what you might have expected, what I expected, is that in both groups, adding exercise was beneficial in preventing any increase in adiposity. So keep these pictures in mind now as we go to the CT data, because the muscle pattern is exactly the same. Loss in the group that got nothing, gain in the group that got estradiol and exercise, and apparent preservation by either estradiol alone or exercise alone. But remember with fat mass, previously exercise was the benefit. And that's not true when we look at subcutaneous and visceral fat changes. Now, in the group that had their estradiol levels suppressed, exercise did not seem to prevent that. If the prevention of abdominal adiposity, at least in this, these exploratory data, seemed to be an estrogen-driven phenomenon. In that study I told you about where this model has been used in men, this is work done by Joel Finkelstein, it was reported in a New England Journal paper in 2013, Very, they didn't do exercise, but the, the increases in abdominal adiposity in that study were not driven by the loss of testosterone, they were driven by the loss of estrogen. So estrogen is also a very important sex hormone in men. Uh, we are fortunate our, at our institution to have a whole room calorimeter so we can look at total body energy expenditure over 24 hours. Remember I told you that overectomy in rodents causes a decrease in metabolic rate. So we have measures of resting energy expenditure and total energy expenditure. This was at baseline before intervention in our two treatment groups and this is a subset of our original cohort. We predicted that resting metabolic rate would decrease in the group that we suppressed. That was true, a magnitude of almost 60 calories a day, which if not compensated, uh, that would result in a, an increase in one pound of fat about every um, uh, 40, 60 days or so, maybe a little bit longer than that. 
Um, and that was prevented by estradiol treatment. And when we looked at total energy expenditure, the decrease in, uh, in the placebo group was about 130 calories a day. And that's a gain in fat mass about once every 30 days. And that was not fully pre prevented by estradiol treatment. But this is a snapshot in time, and there were some uh, changes in sleep, um, at least what women reported as sleep quality. So we're following up on this with even better ways of assessing energy expenditure under these conditions. And we often think that uh, changes in basal metabolic rate are driven by changes in lean mass, because lean mass consumes more energy than fat mass. So I'm showing you the data that I had on the previous slide, now with changes in lean mass reflected in these two treatment groups. And I'm going to just add the placebo and exercise group here. That group had a maintenance of uh, lean mass, but they didn't have a maintenance of resting metabolic rate or total energy expenditure. So here's an outcome that also seems to be driven by sex hormone status to a greater degree than exercise status, at least based on these very preliminary data. And we did measure physical activity in our cohort using accelerometry. Women wore these devices for one week out of every month, starting before the intervention, and then uh, every um, month of the intervention. So you can see by month uh, two of intervention, the groups begin to separate, and that was statistically significant over the last three months of treatment, whereby the estrogen-treated women were reporting or recording higher levels of spontaneous physical activity than the uh, placebo-treated group. So all of our early work uh, to this point in time suggests that the phenotype in humans is very similar to what we see in all of this preclinical evidence, that the loss of gonadal function has a tremendous impact on uh, bioenergetics, some aspects of metabolic function, and perhaps also from our preliminary data on spontaneous physical activity. Um, I want to transition to the last uh, section of my slide just to briefly introduce you to this um, large multicenter study we know as MotorPack. This is based on the knowledge that shouldn't be Heath benefits, that should be health benefits of physical activity. We've got uh, a solid base of, of uh, evidence that physical activity has multiple benefits on health, ranging from all-cause mortality to cardiovascular disease, diabetes, certain types of cancers, and many other things. But in terms of the knowledge of the mechanisms that by which these, these benefits occur, that evidence base is very small, because much of our scientific foundation is observational data showing that people who are more active are, are healthier. So the overarching goal of MotorPack is to assemble this comprehensive map of molecular changes that occur in response to physical activity or exercise, and when possible, to relate these changes to the benefits of physical activity. So this map is going to contain the many molecular signals that transmit these health effects. These are going to be omics data. And we are going to be charged with trying to determine whether these signals are altered or different when we look at factors such as age or sex or level of obesity, fitness level, and finally exposure to exercise. And this is going to be a database that will be public facing. So it'll be available to scientists around the world to help guide your research on uh, understanding how and why uh, exer exercise has these benefits on health. So there are multiple components of this. There are clinical centers that will conduct a large exercise intervention trial. There's a coordinating center to keep us moving forward, a bioinformatics center that's going to develop this, this database and this inter interface to the scientific community. These uh, sites called chemical analysis sites are all the omics centers. And then there are also animal study sites that are going to conduct studies in parallel with the human studies and interrogate tissues that can't be interrogated in humans. 
So the goal is to study 3,000 um, um, people nationwide, 300 children at one pediatric center, and 2,700 adults. Most of the adults will come in sedentary and be randomized to go through endurance exercise training, resistance exercise training. A small number of them will be studied over time to understand what the variability in these responses are in the absence of exercise. And then as comparator groups, we'll also bring in a small group of highly fit endurance or resistance trained individuals who will be tested just at one time point. So there will be phenotypic characterizations done uh, at baseline, a variety of outcomes here, and then also characterize these things at the end of the intervention period. And then to generate the tissues that will be um, distributed to all of the chemical analysis sites, the omic centers, um, in humans we'll be getting blood, um, vastus lateralis, muscle tissue biopsies, and adipose tissue biopsies that will be subjected to just about every omics analysis that you can conceive. Um, and from your perspective, the community at large, there will be some potential opportunities to align with this trial as it's going on. There will be some ancillary studies that will be supported by other institutes at the NIH. NIDDK has already released one FOA. I think the deadline for that is coming up. So if you haven't already responded to that, you probably won't have time, but we expect that there will be others. And then there will be ancillary uh, studies that will uh, utilize the biorepository, which is being managed by Russ Tracy. Um, it's not quite clear when those samples will be available, but they will be samples from both the humans and the animals that would be available to you. Um, whoever applies for these has to also apply for the funding to do whatever experiments you propose on these samples. Um, so to learn more about this, you can go to uh, the website, motorpack.org, a lot of different uh, tabs here. Uh, the one I've highlighted here, if you're interested in this, uh, is how to apply uh, for a collaborative or ancillary study. Uh, and as I wrote in my application when I applied for the clinical center that we were awarded, I argued that this would be our first major step into precision exercise medicine as we learn more about these molecular responses to exercise, we can understand if uh, specific, specific transducers or signaling pathways are turned on or turned off by exercise, and if we know that certain drug targets uh, align with those same signaling factors or pathways, we can begin to understand better when lifestyle interve intervention might be as effective as a pharmacologic treatment uh, for a, uh, treating some disease or condition, and whether that is specific at a certain point in age, if it's relative to sex, or any other of many conditions that we'll be able to evaluate in, the, evaluate in this, uh, this large database that we'll be generating. So thank you very much.